Here's your host, Alex Garrett. Well, you know, uh, I had seen my next guest on um, Pix11 covering the uh, whole Chauvin reaction after the verdict uh, at Washington Square Park on Pix11. And Rob Hoyle, you know, I, I remember 12 years ago, literally almost to the day, it feels like you were at the Viscardi School doing some reporting of your own at Viscardi. And here we are 12 years later connected. I love this. Welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's great to be on. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to, to talk to you. Yeah, and you know, I just when, when I saw your hit at Washington Square Park, I'm like, that's about the same time, you know, time frame where you came out and did profiles of us at, at Viscardi, and I, I want to say thank you again for that. I mean, that was a special day. Yeah, yeah, that was a great. That was a great. Day. I loved going to the Viscardi School and uh, and doing stories there. A lot of inspirational stories, and we got to meet you and 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 see all the great things that you're doing uh, in your career, which is awesome. And we ran into each other like in Penn Station a few years ago. So we we go way back. But I got to ask you right off the bat here, because, you know, I do adaptability and adapting with Alex Garrett, so-and-so. Adapting to covering news in the pandemic, and I know you were in Northwell Health as well. We'll get to that. But from the PIX11 side, uh, what's that adaptation been like to cover the news during this pandemic? Uh, Is there protections that a field reporter must take to even be out there, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, which I saw you did take at Washington Square Park, uh, as in a mask wearing and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, obviously it was a, a lot more stressful in the beginning of the pandemic Pandemic when, when a lot less was known, um, especially before we, we were, you know, the, the mask mandate came down. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a little scary in the beginning. I, I feel more comfortable now. I'm vaccinated, so I, I feel more comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, I still feel like when I'm in a crowd, though, I still I still wear a mask. I feel kind of safe when, you know, because I'm vaccinated and it's been a while since I've been vaccinated. I actually also got covid uh, around Christmas time. But I think just, you know, when I'm in areas where there's a lot of people, I put my mask on just so other people feel comfortable. Uh, you know, and I don't want people to think that, like, I'm, I'm an anti-masker by not wearing my mask. So anytime I'm in a crowded space, um, I'll, I'll have the mask on. Um, if I'm in an area where I know that, that I'm, I'm, you know, socially distanced from people and, and there's not a lot of people walking right past me, uh, then I'll take it off. You know what I, I was seeing is because you're with Northwell Health also, and that, that whole hospital yep. has had milestone after milestone. And so mixing the two together, the two jobs roles together, how have you how exciting in a sense has it been to cover this to cover the good news as well uh, out of this pandemic it's great you know i mean that's one of the things too that we try to to highlight at northwell health and northwell health is is a huge health system and we have 22 hospitals and a ton of ambulatory sites so you know we highlighted those stories that were um you know the the wins the feel good stories the people who who were able to you know get out of the hospital some people who you know, we did a story about a woman who who was pregnant and had COVID and she was in really bad shape and they delivered the baby um, and she didn't get a chance to see the baby till like a month later. So it was a great reunion to see her and her baby reunite. We did a lot of, um, you know, milestones uh, at North Shore University Hospital when the thousandth patient was released. Um, you know, it, it was tough for the doctors and the nurses. So those wins were important. Uh, and there were great stories to highlight. Also interesting what you were just talking about, about safety, what we were doing at Northwell uh, through technology, which is great. We're able to share our story so I can go, you know, I'll, I'll shoot video for Northwell and I'll be able to share that video uh, with the news outlets. And we'll say, hey, look, you know, um, you know, we're, we're making this you know, video available today. We released our 10,000th patient up at Northern Westchester Hospital and, and we have video of it and we have a soundbite with one of our doctors, um, you know, that we can make available for you if you want to use it. And it was kind of interesting to see stations using it. I think a lot of stations and a lot of crews were very happy to be able to get, um, you know, uh, materials from uh, – from stations to be able to have, you know, content to use. And of course, you know, as a reporter, you know, they would call up and ask their questions to the doctor or, or to the PR people uh, and make sure their information is accurate um, and not just be doing a commercial for Northwell, but um, but also telling those stories, which was kind of cool. And also we always made our doctors available through things like um, Teams and Zoom so, so reporters can ask questions, you know. Absolutely. So was, I was going to say, nice. the Zoom life, I mean, you are you want to be out in the field. So it, it must have been a little tough, unless you did still do on-field reporting during the pandemic. But if it was on Zoom, I'm sure that was a little like, why can't I be out there again? You know, that kind of feeling. 
Yeah, you know, but then there was also the feeling of, too, do I want to be out there, you know? So, like, you know, during covering the protest, it was a little hairy sometimes because, you know, during the protest were the few times where all of a sudden, you know, social distancing wasn't really possible. Um, you know, you try to keep your distance but all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of people turn a corner and they're walking past you. And, you know, so, uh, you know, always constantly uh, hand sanitizing and, and trying to stay six feet apart and wear the mask. Um, I didn't get sick from uh, covering the news. I don't really actually know how I got sick, um, but that's the crazy thing. How how contagious this virus is, is that, you know, I could have gotten it, you know, pumping gas at a gas station. I always try every time I do something like that, go to the supermarket. As soon as the moment I get back in my car, you know, hand sanitize, pump gas, hand sanitize. But, you know, you never know. Like, you, you know, you, you get comfortable. Maybe you, you touch your face or, or rub your eye. And next thing you know, <laughs> Well what, well, what can you tell us also? Because Northwell Health, Health made history with the vaccine. If you remember, the first person vaccinated in New York yeah. City was, was one of your nurses. Did you cover that event at all? I was there, yeah, Sandra Lindsay. I was actually, you know, which was also very exciting. I was at Forest Hills, L, um, uh, LIJ Forest Hills, when the va first vaccine came in, and it came in on a UPS truck. So, again, another great situation where I'm there with my camera, and a monopod and and i'm you know getting video of this box being wheeled into the hospital and then you know we bring it into the pharmacy and they take it out and the smoke comes out because it was in dry ice um, and they took one of the vials out and went into a, a room and we got video through the glass of the pharmacist uh, mixing the, the the vaccine and then uh then they did a transport to lij where Sanderson was waiting and the governor was there and yeah, it was it was a pretty awesome experience. So there were a lot of news crews that actually were in that big room that were able to shoot that video. We also had like, you know, made a video feed available for people who couldn't be there or, you know, couldn't get into the room to use. Uh, and then I made my video available later on you know, through a Dropbox link. It's like, hey, if anybody wants a video of the first vaccine arriving, you know, we have this video, the first that, you know, the, the, of it being mixed and whatnot. So uh, kind of great to get that message out. And, and Sandra Lindsay is, she, we couldn't have picked a, a nicer, better uh, role model spokesperson for uh, getting the vaccine than Sandra. She was just awesome. I had worked with her before um, and she was just great, a great spokesperson for, for the importance of getting the vaccine. And it was kind of cool that she, you know, we were at that press conference uh on that day, I forget what day of the week it was. Maybe it was a Monday. I, I think it was a Monday, a actually. I'm, I might be yeah, going I remember, go, I remember going into a gas station the next morning, and, and she was on the cover of every single newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the New York Post, the Daily News, and it was, it was cool to see. Uh, and then she started doing all – then she hit the circuits, and she was on all the uh -huh. TV morning talk shows, the evening talk shows. She was on The View. Um, but great, really good. You know, gave us hope. Light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I was going to say, you know, covering this a year ago, and even in the summer of last year, could you add on the the riots and everything that happened? I mean, last year, everybody felt like it was a rut we weren't going to get out of. But what are you seeing in the field now, Rob, uh, that you didn't see last year? Do you see a lot more optimism that you're feeling while out on the field, or, or is there still some nervousness? What's it like from last year to now? Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a, a, a much uh, great sense of relief. I think we feel more comfortable. Uh, you know, we still we still don't want to let our guard down, but it, you know, most of the people that I'm working with now are vaccinated. And if I'm working with a photographer that I haven't seen in a while, you know, like that's usually the first question that I ask or the first question that they ask. Hey, vaccinated? Vaccinated? Yeah. Then we feel we feel safe. We still Channel Eleven adopted a policy um, in the beginning of the of the pandemic to not. Um, travel together, which was kind of a little bit difficult um, because, you know, you're used to meeting your crew and getting into the live truck and then, you know, driving to the location together. And while the photographer is driving, you could be making phone calls, checking on the story, you know, maybe calling contacts, whatever. Now I'm driving my car. And then, you know, and then, of course, parking is always difficult. You know, the news truck pretty much can park anywhere it wants. You know, it's got a billboard on it. It says mm -hmm. Channel 11. So police and parking people usually don't give them a hard time, but my own personal car, it's like, you know, well, I got to find the unit meter or whatever. So, um, and, and we're still driving our own cars. I hope that gets lifted soon. I mean, the CDC says if, 
you know, you're with somebody else who's vaccinated. You don't need to wear the mask. You don't need to socially distance. Um, so we're hoping the station lifts that, that ban soon uh, as far as, you know, so we can just, um, you know, get back in the truck with, with the guys. Um, Rob, you've had, you, you said earlier you had COVID. So I'm guessing the work that you were able to do after getting COVID made you really feel a lot better. Like what was that experience like? And then what was life like covering the events after having experienced it yourself? Yeah, you know, uh, it was interesting. It's, 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 it's so wild how it affects people so differently. So I got COVID. It was, it was strange. I got COVID the day after the snowstorm. We had this early December snowstorm and I woke up and I felt achy and I was like, Oh no, like, you know, cause every time I, during COVID, when you felt like something wasn't right, you're like, Oh, I got COVID, you know, or, or, Oh my God, I hope I don't have COVID. So I woke up after the snowstorm feeling achy and I said, Oh, and I said, well, you know what? I was shoveling snow. I haven't shoveled snow. And I didn't think it snowed the year before. I'm like, I haven't shoveled snow in two years. That's why I'm achy. And working for Northwell, I went into in Northwell, I went into, uh, to the office and we were all pretty much working from home, but I had something to do that day. And, and I was just feeling a little bit off. And I had mentioned something to one of the security people. And he said, hey, you know, they're actually doing testing up on the third floor. I said, really? And he said, yeah, why well, might as well go get a test. And I said, yeah, why not? So I went up and got the test and uh, didn't think anything of it. Started feeling better. And, and that evening, uh, I got the email that my test results were back. And I was sitting on the couch with my wife. And I said, oh, I got my test results. And I looked. I said, oh, my God, I'm, I'm positive. And she said, no, you're joking. And, and I showed her the email. And she was like, wow. And then she, she was like, Go downstairs in the basement, um, you know, to quarantine. And Chris but, but Paul, that, right, going downstairs to just quarantine from everybody. Yeah, you know, but by that point, like, it was already too late because when I was the most contagious, I was already around my family. So it's really hard, right? Like when you live in a house with somebody, for other people not to get it when you when you have it. Um, but I was lucky. I mean, and my and I was lucky that in the regard that my family, you know, we all had very mild symptoms and we. We recovered, you know, relatively quickly. Um, so that was good. Did it, did it, uh, at that point, annoy you a little bit that people may not have ever had it are sort of like, why are we in lockdown and whatnot? I mean, it, when you have it, it hits, it hits differently, doesn't it? The whole It one- certainly does. And it's scary because, you know, even though when I found out I was feeling good, you think, oh, my God, like, you know, because I, I saw the stories. I heard the stories. My wife is a physician assistant, so she she was actually at Forest Hills on the front lines. And, you know, she is a PA. She's a physician assistant. She's been a physician assistant for like 20 years and uh, maybe longer than 20 years. And she witnessed one death in her whole career. And basically she was, you know, witnessing a death each shift. And it was hard, you know, so like you get scared, like, oh, my God, am I going to rapidly de- decline, you know, uh, and or if I give it to my kids, are they going to get it and they're going to have it bad? Um, my parents wound up getting it, not from me, like months later, uh, they got it. My mom, totally fine. My dad was on death's doorstep. Um, he wound up getting the monoclonal antibody infusion, and, and I believe it saved his life. Um, so, you know, you never know what's going to happen. It affects everybody differently. So yeah, it was scary. But then like, you know, after a couple of days, I started feeling better about myself. But when my dad got it, I, I was very nervous for him. Um, and, but the mono, the monoclonal antibody infusion really, really worked for him. And you're on Long Island, right? So what, what what's yeah. it like to see that whole area of Long Island open pretty much? And then you come to the city and nothing, it's like, to me, it's such a confusing thing how one part of the state could be open and the other part is completely still shut down in a sense. It's yeah, you know, it was it was super eerie. I mean, like, you know, you, you, you travel all over the city and to see New York City quiet and to see New York City like kind of closed. I remember being at the Javits Center covering a story one one. um one Saturday, and and the story basically was how the the Javits Center was soon going to open to treat COVID patients. And I was at the Javits, and, you know, so I finished my shift, and I made a left on 34th Street, and I drove down 34th Street, and it was the most eerie thing. I hit every single green light. Like, I've never (laughs) driven, you know, from 12th Street all the way to the, pretty much to the tunnel, like, without a light. Like, and I went across town, like, in minutes, you know, where, you know, I'm so used to being, if, you know, I'm in a news van, you know, watching the light change three times before you even get through the intersection. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think my thought on that was that, you know, um, everybody fled the city and came to Long Island. So Long Island was a little more crowded. You know, the supermarkets, you know, would be crowded. It was a little scary going to the supermarkets, you know, especially with these weird things like, you know, not being able to buy toilet paper. 
Um, and I remember like, you know, coming home in the beginning, especially right. Like w- wiping down like all the products you bought, like with wipes and stuff and, and then not knowing it, <laughs> what to do with fruits and vegetables. Um, but yeah, the city was, was, yeah, like it looked pretty normal on Long Island. Like, you know, for the most part, like Long Island supermarkets and stuff, they were open. Uh, but the city, yeah, it was eerie. I mean, it was just like a ghost town. I, I know we kind of have weird views politically. We're a little different, but um, did you get to cover any of the politics of this, or were you more in the feel-good story realm for PIX11? You know, I mean, really more just reporting on the news. I mean, you know, the politics were, were weird. I mean, I did cover uh, the the Rose Garden super spreader event. You know, uh, I mean, right, say what you want about the president. I mean, he, he – uh, you know, he was trying, I guess you could say he was trying to, to, to try and instill a sense of calm to the nation and, and, you know, like things are business as usual. But that super, you know, that Rose Garden event, you know, wound up turning out. I think the president got sick from that, too. Um, so and, you would go down and, to D.C. You know, for them? Because I, I had no, noticed. No, no, no. I, I, only, I only covered it from New York. I only covered it. We, we actually did a live shot in front of. Trump Tower, uh, and we just basically just gave like the timeline and the people who were, you know, mentioned that the people who who were infected. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Trump Tower. The whole city is going to be a little different when it does reopen fully because you won't have all those. I don't think you're going to have barricades there, so it'll be a little, a little easier to roll past and, and everything. But I've got to ask yeah. you about the newsroom because, as you know, and as everybody in the knows, yeah. the newsroom is camar- camaraderie. It's it's building connection. It's building friendship. Yeah. Are we now in a changed newsroom forever or will we get back to everybody in one place? How, how do you see that playing out? I don't know. You know, that is a great question um, because it was so weird. It was so weird not like going up to the newsroom. Like normally when I would start a shift, I would walk up to the newsroom and, you know, and, and see the writers and the producers and walk over to the assignment desk and ask what's happening and what, what story I'm covering and, you know, what photographer I'm going to be going with. And, and to that totally stop, like where we weren't even allowed in the newsroom. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, you had writers and editors that were, were working from home. And so everybody adapted with the technology, but it was really strange. And it still is strange. I mean, since, since the pandemic started, I think I've been in the newsroom a couple of times, um, you know, and, and things have changed as far as how many people are allowed and when, when is appropriate time to come into the newsroom. Um, but right, this whole new world of like, okay, I will meet you in Queens. Okay, I'll meet you at the location in Brooklyn. Or, you know, we're getting to the location of a, of a story before the photographer and saying, okay, I'm here and I'm parked on this corner and, you know, uh, I'll look for you when you get here with the photographer sending a text saying, hey, I got here and I'm, I'm on, you know, 33rd and 5th or whatever. And, you know, then you'd meet him. Uh, and then, you know, going home afterwards, like, you know, normally we'd drive back to the station and sometimes maybe we would, you know, after a shift maybe go out and get a drink or something and like fat and right across the street i don't know if it's open right 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 you know so and it's like you know we were on this location like all right bye bye and then you know get in the car and go you know yeah it's it's different and you know as you know rolling past all the news trucks i get a very big high off that because i love that but yeah it's just not been even uh, I don't know. I didn't even really notice it during the, the big parts of last summer and everything. Then again, I stayed out of there because I didn't know what it was going to turn into. So maybe there were news trucks. But normally, I, I'm used to seeing them everywhere. They just have been reduced entirely, no? Uh, I don't know. I think the trucks are still out there. But, you know, it's also true. I mean, we're going through a big change in, in, in technology. I mean, technology is amazing, and it's always changing. And so a lot of times, you know, like what was really interesting to see that you would have never seen before is that you started seeing live shots, right? <laughs> where the reporter is walking with the protesters or following yeah. the protesters. Like, how do you do that? How long is that cable from the news truck? Well, it's, it's not a cable anymore. It's a, it's called, you know, the, when we talk about backpack journalism, that the, the, the photographers have this little backpack that they, they wear on their back. Uh, that's called either live view or digero. And basically it's sending the, the live video um, through cell, cell channels. And, and so then they can move around. So a lot of times, you know, we have these live trucks that, we don't, don't even wind up using. We wind up using this backpack that, that can transmit live. So I don't know if we're going to get to a point where you're not going to see those trucks anymore because now a photographer can drive in a crew car um, and, and cover the news and, you know, just plug this, this Digero in. Um, some of the others, you know, New York One and um, Fios, when they were around, they're no longer around, but like News 12, like, the, you know, some, 
some of these backpack journalists can do it all by themselves, you know, um, which can be scary in situations where you have, you know, these protests that sometimes get a little bit out of hand. You know, it's definitely good to be with an extra person, you know. So um, I always like when I see some of these one man crews, I'm like, you know, hats off to you, you're brave. But I think our station and, and most stations always tell their, their crews, like, if you don't feel safe, get out of there. Run out, get out of Dodge, exactly. So, Rob, right. you also sort of been a teacher. Like, I remember you came out to Viscardi because you kind of want to get to know what the kids there wanted to do, sort of a media, the future. So if you're a tell a kid today uh, who wants to break into media and they're seeing the changes too, but maybe not the way you're seeing it, what would you tell them in this ever-changing world of reporting now? It's a good question. So I actually, I do teach a class at Hofstra University. I teach a broadcast writing and reporting class. Um, and I tell my students, I say, you know, you, you, it's amazing, right? Like, the, especially these new iPhones, they shoot basically 4K quality. So I tell my students, you know, when you see something happening, right? And, and it's great that we have this technology, right? Because in the George Floyd case, right? If, if we didn't have this technology where everybody has cameras on their phones, right? That story could have been that, um, oh, some guy named George Floyd died in police custody. And, and people would have been like, okay, you know, next story. Like, but we saw it because people have cameras and, and, and we, we couldn't believe what we saw. And, and so, you know, that's what sparked all this reform. So I tell my students, I say, you have your camera phone, you see something happening, record it. Um, something's happening around you. You know, did you turn your camera around in, in selfie mode and, and do a stand up? Or, you know, if you want, you get a little tripod and, and put your camera on there. And because when you're looking to, you know, get a job in this business, um, the news directors are looking at what you can do on camera, how you look on camera, how you come across, you know, and tell a story. Um, you know, resumes are great. Written resumes are great. But nobody in the TV business hires somebody based on a written resume, unless it's somebody famous, right? Like some of those reporters that, you know, like, uh, I guess you know, Anderson Cooper doesn't have to send his resume real. Um, but the news directors want to see people telling stories. They want to see how people react in, in situations. And so I tell my students, you know, you go to these, you know, you don't have to go out and, and, and spend money on a fancy camera and fancy equipment. You can use your iPhone. Uh, and it's pretty wild, too. You see us in, in the news business, you know, how, how often do you see cell phone video and stories and Citizen App, right? How right. Citizen App. Yeah. Well, you know, I was just thinking because over the week we saw this one kid who's now 18. She sort of got vilified for not stopping the George Floyd incident. But I guess there it's almost like how do you stop something like that? It's almost impossible. So did that ever come up in yeah. your discussion with, the, with your students or not really? No, nah, I mean, you know, not that particular question, but like, again, I always say you know, safety first, always make sure you're, you're, you're safe and always make sure, you know, you're aware of your surroundings. Like we always say this in, in stories too, like some of these strange stories where like somebody will just come up to, to a random person and hit them or whatever, um, you know, uh, and people who are on cell phones and not paying attention, you know, or are more at risk. So it's like, always be aware of your surroundings. You almost have like a spidey senses, right? Like you have a sixth sense. You can kind of tell when something's not right. Um, and that's when you really have to be aware in the situations where if you have to leave, you got to go. The George Floyd thing, yeah, these people were on the street. They were telling the police officers to stop. But what do you do? Do you go in there and intervene with the police officer and then maybe, you know, get arrested yourself or, or you know, it's, it's worse. Tough. That's what I was worried about for them. If they intervene, worse would happen to them, you know. Right. You know, so, you know, I think those people were kind of and, and it was, you know, I feel bad for them. They had to watch that and they were trying to tell the cops, stop, stop. You're killing them, you know. Um so did you ever feel when you were out in the field that you were in danger at all or not necessarily? I tell you, during the, 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 some, of, some, of the, some of the protests, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, I actually called my desk and I'm like, I want to get out of here because, you know, what's interesting is, is that, you know, police have always been I kind of like, you know, you as a reporter, you're always kind of like, all right, if, I'm, if there's police there, I'm safe. You know, like you feel safe when there's police around. And during the protests, you know, sometimes there was there was a situation one time where people started throwing things at the police officers. And it was like we were in the middle and it was like, oh, my God. Like and sometimes like you could tell, like the police weren't too happy with some of the coverage, you know, uh, from reporters. So sometimes you can you can feel like police looking at you like <laughs> they no longer really like you. And and so like you're in the middle, we're in the middle as 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 reporters. And, and it's like kind of no man's land, you know, so. Uh, and then, you know, when things start flying, it gets a little scary and intense. Not that somebody's trying to, you know, necessarily hit us, but like, you know, we're in the crossfire. Um, does that, so. did that, but personally, does that irritate you that they're trying to attack cops that didn't even have anything to do with 
anything in Minnesota. That kind of was where I was frustrated. Yes. Like, these cops are not doing anything. They're they're actually right. keeping you peace. Exactly. Peace. Right. They're, right. Exactly. They're keeping the peace. They're doing their jobs. I mean, I think look, there's you know there's good and bad and everything, right? So I I would say like ninety five percent, you know, maybe more of cops are good that they they took a, an oath to protect and serve, and that's what they do. Yeah, and it is weird. I mean, it is strange that like right all these protests for something, but I think it was you know just a, a bigger. You know, it was a bigger movement. And um, I think that, you know, uh, for the most part, the protests were uh, peaceful. I think everybody who all the people who organized the protests wanted to be peaceful. But and imagine, reason, you know, and as a matter of fact, they were protecting the police. Some of them were actually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the police said this. They said there's some bad, I think the words they used is some bad actors or agitators. Right. And it's true. If you think about it, like there's a lot of sometimes we, we, when you do covering a police story, police will say it was a crime of opportunity. Well, what does that mean? It was like, well, John Smith didn't mean to break into a car and steal, uh, you know, a laptop computer. But when John Smith is walking past a car and the windows open and there's a laptop computer sitting on the on the on the front seat, it's like, hmm, you know, and that's what they call a crime of opportunity. Right. So, you know, John Smith didn't go out, plan his day to go do it, but he saw this opportunity. And that's what like a police will say uh, a lot of times, you know, they'll put out those things, you know, lock your cars, you know, don't leave valuables on the front seat, you know? And, and so, you know, because somebody walking past may say, Oh, look, that's some, an easy thing for me to, to take, you know, not that it's right. And, and, and morally, you know, I would never do that. Um, but I think the same thing happened during these protests some of these bad actors or agitators, right, saw these crimes of opportunity. Well, look, the police are all concerned on what's going on over here, and nobody's watching the storefront, you know, or somebody broke the window, terrible, and now, like, wow, look at all this stuff that's just kind of laying there, and nobody's paying attention, you know. So, uh, you know, things got a little out of hand, but I think that, you know, for the most part, the the people who are organizing these protests for change were um you know were telling the people and and, and you know were being peaceful they wanted to to get there i mean you're going to do much better right like martin luther king you're going to do much better with with a peaceful protest than with a, a violent protest but you know i i also even saw some of the one time I, when i was covering a protest i saw some some what looked like skinheads you know trying to, to, to start with, with some of the protesters, calling them names and getting them all riled up, you know, and it was almost In fact, like some of them actually it. were the ones trying to break in, and, and the peaceful protesters were, no, why are you doing that? It just was, it was all right. wild to see. But, Rob, you know, the, um, the role of the media has been criticized, I think, from every angle these days. But how vital is it yeah. to still have that presence. I mean, yeah, we can kind of go on our own sources, but there is still a need for media. But do you think the media Absolutely. should be held more accountable now that things are coming out about everything? I mean, uh, are we seeing a, an accountability movement on media more than ever before? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, my station has said, like, you know, make sure your facts are right. You know, make sure, you know, you're confirming your information. Like we went through a phase, like we don't want to, you know, we don't want to put anything on the air that we don't know is, is you know, that, that we don't know is not 100 percent true. So, yeah, I think there needs to be accountability. I think too many times like, oh, a source said this or or, or you know, and things kind of, you know, and you see you see mistakes on the news, but also too like think how important uh, the news is. Right. Like so there was this um, shooting on Long Island uh, last week. And, um, you know, how important is it for the news media to get that message out that, hey, there's an active shooting situation happening right now in West Hempstead and, you know, stay away from the area. <laughs> Don't go there, you know, and if you live in, in the vicinity, you know, lock your doors, you know, because somebody <laughs> might be coming through your yard with a gun or trying to get in your house to hide. Uh, they put the schools on lockdown. So, you know, that's those are, you know, I think that's what we need to know as a society when things are danger, like to stay out of danger. Um, for, you know, families who are working to hear this story coming down and like, oh, my God, is my kid safe? All right, my kid's school is locked down. Okay, good. They're in that protocol. Uh, police are on the scene, you know. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of news that, that, you know, we need news. We need information. And I was going to uh, say, Rob, you, you guys are sort of competing with the national news outlets as well. So I feel like maybe you can agree or disagree that the rise of local news again is so important because maybe people, if they don't, doubt, if they doubt the national stuff, at least build the faith in the local news again. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100 percent. And I think, you know, the local news is what's really you know important. It's funny how like when we talk about elections, right, about how, you know, uh, the voter turnout during elections and more people will, will turn out during presidential elections. But really, the, the more important races are the races that, that affect your, your community, right, that are your um, neighborhood. Right? So I'm sorry about that. No worries. Daughter, no worries. This I'm is... working from home today. My daughter just came home from school. Uh, well, I'm uh, so glad that doing... you took some time out today, and I want to have you back to continue this conversation. Even as 100% yeah. reopens, I think you're going to be out there a lot more, and I'd love to get your take. And uh, thanks for always you know, supporting what I've been up to, and I love supporting what you yeah. guys are up to as well. I mean, Pix11 and I, we have a kind of a long relationship, and so to finally have you on is, is great, so thank you. But i got to say one more thing about Northwell Health. Yeah. I missed the biggest event from in my life almost every year has become the Rangers 5K presented by Northwell oh, Health. Oh, yes. And I missed yes. it this year. Hopefully this year we can get it back. I, You know what? I sh- I'll find that out. And next time I come on your show, I'll, uh, I'll have an update for you on that. I, I know that, right, like we turned a lot of events to virtual. Um, so, yeah, I know that, you know, that's a great event. And uh, I'll find out if that's going to be virtual this year or hopefully it's Look, in person. I mean, I think. And getting to run with uh, Adam Graves and Richter, I mean, that's worth it in the morning for, you know? Yes, yes, and it's over by um, it's over by City Field, right? And so it's it's kind of open, it's outdoors. So hopefully, yeah, it'll be in person this year. Well, and I know the Roadrunners is back at it, which is kind of cool as well. But Rob, again, thank you for taking time out to talk with me about this. Anytime, and, Alex. Always, always great to talk to you. And what the news is saying and then doing in this time of you know all the safety stuff needed. Thanks for giving us an inside look. You got it. And I'm Alex Garrett. Thanks again to Rob Hoyle. And remember, in Adapting with Alex Garrett, we're always adapting. Talk to you soon.